Welcome to Danielle Smith's Razor Forum. This program is part of a series of podcasts doing in-depth interviews on free enterprise and personal liberty. I'm your host, Danielle Smith, president of the Alberta Enterprise Group. Go to fraserforum.org where you can subscribe, comment on the program, and see links to the studies we discuss. You will also find archives of previous episodes. Our email address is danielle at fraserforum.org. We'd love to hear from you. And most economists explain the gender wage gap by saying women and men make very different choices throughout their lives about what they want to do. It's the gender wage gap. If we look at men and women who had the same educational background, who are at their very same point in their career, who haven't yet had kids, the gender wage gap almost dis- almost disappears. Hello, welcome to another edition of Danielle Smith's Fraser Forum. My guest today is Rosemary Fike. She's a senior fellow with the Fraser Institute, but also an instructor of economics at Texas Christian University. And we're going to be talking about a report that she updates regularly called Women and Progress, the Women and Progress Report. And she joins us now to talk about it. Rosemary, thanks so much for being with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I want to I want to know how you come to the issue of looking at women in progress because one thing struck me when I was reading through your report and looking at the conclusion you you assert at the end that uh, capitalism is not incompatible with feminism but I think the starting point for most people is probably the reverse thinking that Capitalism is incompatible with feminism. So do you come at this from uh, sort of the economics point of view, because you're an economics prof, or do you come at it from the feminist point of view? I've always thought that men and women should have equal rights. Uh, There shouldn't be additional barriers that women face that men don't face and vice versa. So I've always had that notion of feminism um, underlying the way I see the world. Uh, But I love markets. And when I talk to my friends who are feminists, because I'm an economist, they often think you're the worst feminist in the world. How can you love markets? How can you be this advocate for capitalism? It's a system that exploits women's labor and treats women unfairly. And yes, markets might have given us all of these things, but men and women don't seem to share equally in the bounty of capitalism. And so so a lot of feminists are starting off from this very strong point of criticism about markets. Um, And so I kind of take a step back and think about things from kind of an extreme perspective where, you know, do women have economic freedom? Like, let's look across the world and see where do women have the most basic rights to participate in the economy? And I do think that feminists should be concerned about these things, because if you think about the elements of economic freedom, freedom of movement, um, you know, freedom to start your own business, um, having an aspect of financial freedom, right, the ability to own and transfer property, all of these things are, I think of them as essential human rights, because if I'm a woman in a country where I don't have any access to economic freedom, and I find myself in in a really unpleasant situation. Maybe I have a husband who's not so nice to me and I want to make a plan to leave. Economic freedom is a life raft for me. I could get a job without having to ask permission of my husband. I can open up a bank account, start saving away. I can make plans to move on my own without being restricted. Right. So, so, you know, all of, if we really concern, if we're really concerned about women's well-being, Right. Economic freedom seems like something that is absolutely essential, especially if you're a woman in an unpleasant situation. Are you able to talk about that first problem that a lot of those who who self-identify as being feminist complain about the market, which is that it doesn't result in equal outcomes or equitable outcomes or fair outcomes? We often hear that manifested each year when they do the report on the gender wage gap. Have you done some work on that? To, to And get, can you give us your perspective on, on why it is we have that disparity. I feel if we don't address that, then then trying to uh, talk about having that basic entry into the market is mm-hmm. is still going to to fall on deaf ears. Because I guess the the sense I would have is people would say, "Well, aren't you just imposing 
a market system and the same disparities on other countries when we start talking about it. So I want to understand how you look at that disparity issue and whether you think it's a problem. Absolutely. Um, the way I look at mark the, the market outcomes that seem unequal, like the gender wage gap, I think of it as a function not of the market, but of the gender norms that are present in that society. So a lot of it boils down to, um, you know, how are we dividing household labor? What's the expectation of who's going to take care of kids or do most of the household labor? Um, even in the United States and Canada, uh, fairly well-developed countries that don't have formal barriers to what women can and cannot do, um, those social norms are such that women are expected to carry the majority of that responsibility. And so we see things like the gender wage gap, and most economists explain the gender wage gap by saying women and men make very different choices throughout their lives about what they want to do. Right? The gender wage gap, if we look at men and women who had the same educational background, who are at their very same point in their career, who haven't yet had kids, the gender wage gap almost, dis almost disappears. It boils down to just a couple of cents. Um, it's th those choices about what am I going to major in? What kind of career do I want? What kind of hours can I work? All of those things are influenced by, you know, do I want to have a kid? Do I want to start a family? If I do want to have a kid and start a family and I know I'm going to be carrying a lot of that responsibility, then maybe I don't want to go to graduate school for so long. Maybe I don't want to take that really intense financial management position that's going to have me working long hours. Maybe I don't want to take the job that requires a lot of travel. And a lot of those things come with higher pay rates. So when we talk about the gender wage gap, the gender wage gap is, is not controlling for what kind of jobs that men, or women, men and women are doing. The gender wage gap is saying, on average, all men make about this much and all women on average make about this much. And so you're lumping in you know, engineers and preschool teachers and baristas and lawyers and all of these people are lumped together. But if women are making systematically different choices about the kind of jobs they're entering into, then you're going to see that unequal. Um, so I don't view it as an outcome of the market. I view it as the market kind of reflecting what our our gender norms are. It's kind I'm of just... a mirror. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a better way for us to look at that data then, because I suppose what we want to make sure is that uh, those who are making the same choices are getting the same level of pay. And does that hold throughout? Uh, are we able to stratify the data that 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 said in that detail? So a lot of the gender wage gap data, it's very messy, especially if we're looking at a cross country estimate. Um, there was a really interesting study a couple of years ago. John List was one of the co-authors, but uh, was, there's was a bunch of co-authors on this paper. I think Cook was the lead author, but it's focusing on Uber drivers. And it's really great because instead of having this big, messy data set, it's very highly controlled. So they look at Uber drivers um, and they're trying to figure out, do men earn more than women on average? And the platform doesn't discriminate. If you want to be an Uber driver, as long as you have a car that's functional, you can go ahead and be an Uber driver. And they also looked at the rate at which rides were rejected by customers. And they found that men aren't getting rejected as drivers, you know, at any, you know, that the rate of rejection by passengers is exactly the same. People mm -hmm. aren't rejecting female drivers more than they're rejecting male drivers. So all of the normal kind of, uh, you know, customer demand driven type of discrimination and producer driven discrimination. It's not possible with the Uber platform. It's all controlled for. And so they found that, you know, men on average are still making about seven cents more per mm -hmm. hour per hour than or seven cents on the dollar more than women are. Um, and so it boiled down to what type of rides they accepted? Are they taking those longer journeys that tend to be more lucrative? Um, how fast are they driving? Men tend to drive faster than women, so they're completing more rides. And how long are they remaining an Uber driver? Are they getting into that um, and staying a very long time and accumulating experience? Or are they you know, having a brief stint and, and not really accumulating much experience? 
And often, you know, what times are they working? Are they working that bar shift where, you know, people are desperate for rides? Um, and so women, again, a lot of it can be tied mm -hmm. to their household responsibilities. If I have to take care of kids, um, I don't know that I want to lock myself into an Uber trip that's going to take me two hours round trip. I don't know that I'm going to want to work at two or three o'clock in the morning if I'm the one that is expected to take care of the sick kid if they wake up in the night. So all of these kind of caring household responsibilities that women are generally more expected to do influence the choices that they make. So I think that study is a really great way of kind of paring it down to the choices that we make. Um, but those choices are really influenced by social pressure, those social norms mm -hmm. regarding who should do what. It's, and, and I think that's important, too, because we will talk more about the social pressures in some of the other countries that you've looked at. But it's it's kind of striking, isn't it, that those gender norms are still so entrenched. I'm in the process of watching Mad Men, and I'm kind <laughs> of astonished at the, and that wasn't that long ago. We're talking about the 60s and 70s, but mm -hmm. the women seem to be stratified in a certain role. It's quite rare for a woman to be seen as an equal to a man. And even when the main character played by Elizabeth Moss is working her way up the scale, there you, they, they, they talk about some of the disadvantages that she has because of her gender, some of the expectations mm -hmm. because of her gender. And I, I wonder if we, if we should be looking at, at that as well. Is that, is that something that's a problem? Is that something that will uh, erode over time? Should we be looking at why it is that men aren't taking on more of those household caring roles? Because that's maybe, if we've gone as far as we can on uh, achieving pay equity uh, for those, all things being equal on, uh, if, you're, if you're not a caregiver, maybe we need to look at it at the other side. Is there, is there, is there something we should be looking at it, at why it is men are, are not taking on more of the caregiving roles to equalize it? Does, it, does that matter? Or is that something that it, you can't really measure? I mean, I do think it's really, I mean, th they're two sides of the same coin, right? If women are expected to do it, then we don't have that same expectation on men. We're letting them, in terms of our gender norms, we're kind of letting them off easy. I think things are changing. I do think if you look at, I think the Pew Research Center um, has a lot of good survey data about how household duties are, are split. Um, and so if you look at the more recent data, things are starting to be shared more equitably. Like if you just in, within my household, my husband cooks way more than I do. Right, we have a pretty equitable division of labor. If I'm working late that night, he's cooking dinner. If he's working late that night, I am. Um, and so, you know, we have a pretty balanced split, but we also don't have children. Mm -hmm. So that throws a whole nother wrench into things. Um, if you just, one of the big things we kept hearing at the onset of the, onset of the pandemic is just how many women dropped out of the labor force. I know I don't know if that was as big of a problem in Canada as it is in the United States, but we've seen in the past year one of the biggest decreases in women's labor force participation mm -hmm. that we've ever seen. And it's completely explained by women had to drop out of the labor force because their schools were closed. Mm -hmm. And so they had to stay home and, and help watch the kids in a way that they didn't have to do it before. And they had to be responsible for that online learning. Um, and as a result, a lot of them dropped out of the labor force. Um, so that's a short, so that's a short run, huge cost that when it comes down to it, who was ending up giving up their job in order to take on this role? Well, by and large, it was women. Um, side note, I do think um, in the long run, I think some of the labor market changes due to the pandemic, like the flexible work, that is going to be beneficial to women in the long run. So we see this short run, very big cost. Um, but now, since a lot more a lot more industries are saying, you know, remote work has worked out very well for us, I think that that opens the door for women to enter into occupations like tech industry occupations and other things where they're really underrepresented because the nature of the work has become more flexible. 
I can't oh. wait to see if that's the case because you're I right. I mean, we become <laughs> such experts at using technology and Zoom. And I think in some ways it's sort of remarkable because there's been a slow sort of pressure to allow more work at home. And then all of us had to do it all at once. Mm -hmm. And almost all of the conversations that I, I think business owners are having is how do you create a hybrid approach of having people in the office some of the time and at home some of the time? I'll be really interested to see how that impacts the data. Let, let me ask you, because I think that's one thing that makes us very uncomfortable is that we, we don't think that there should be a having children's penalty. <laughs> there shouldn't there shouldn't be a penalty for wanting to bring up the next generation of kids because we, we all need to have that next generation uh, for a whole variety of societal reasons and economic reasons. And so when you're looking at that issue, do, do you think that, that this flexible work schedule alone will help to, to close that remaining gap? Or are there still other things that you look at about, about how that gap needs to be closed? Or is it just that we accept that some women have a uh, value having children more than they value the dollars that they would earn if they, if they didn't have children. Yeah. I mean, I, the economist in me is absolutely going to say, you're right. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? There's trade-offs <laughs> in everything. Um, and a lot of kind of modern feminists, a lot of the policies that they advocate for are almost as if they're trying to have that free lunch and avoid the trade-off altogether or to push the trade-off onto somebody else. Um, and so I don't think that we can escape that trade-off. Somebody is going to have to do the child rearing. Somebody is going to have to take up, step up and take on that responsibility. Um, and if that is still, ex if women are still expected to do more of that, then I don't think the gender wage gap will close, right? Not until that, that split of household division of labor is a bit more equitable. Um, I do think we're making steps now. If you just listen to the way people speak to their children and uh, you watch television, I think we're making some steps now to start at an early age and really try to change those gender norms. Um, Target, it's a, I know there's no Target in Canada, uh, but in the U.S., uh, Target's a pretty big store, and they actually got rid of the gender designation in their toy section and and mm. clothing section, right? It's just toys, and it's no longer, well, these are the girls' toys, and they're dolls, and it's a uh, play kitchen set, and here's your pretend vacuum, so you can practice doing all of those household duties. Now it's, you know, if a, if a young boy wants to play with those toys, there's no stigma attached because it's not saying that these are just for girls. And all of the STEM toys that were traditionally pushed towards, towards little boys, girls are, are much more encouraged to, to go and take on those, those activities. And so you know, even the way we talk to children, I got into a conversation with my cousin once around Christmas, uh, we were all preparing food in the kitchen and his little boy came in and he wanted to help prepare food. And my cousin was like, oh, are you going to come and hang out with the women in the kitchen and do the women's jobs? And I was just like, mm, there are just jobs. There is just work that needs to be done. And if you want to come and help do this job, you are welcome. And so if we're watching the way we are talking to our children, right, that's how we're going to change those norms. Norms don't change rapidly. Norms change very slowly. And what a lot of modern feminist policy advocates, right? They're trying to legislate away the, legislate straight to the outcome, right? We wanna mandate equal pay. We wanna mandate paid maternity leave. We want to mandate all of these things. Um, and so in medicine, they would call that uh, symptomatic treatment. You're just treating the symptoms. You're not really treating the underlying cause of the problem. And so when you when you do that, right, the, it's it's very unclear if you're going to succeed in what you're trying to achieve. You're just I, meeting the symptoms. I'd love to talk to you more about the underlying issues. And for the record, I look at a vacuum as being a power tool. So my husband <laughs> does everything with power tools. He does the lawn mowing and he does the vacuuming. I can clean bathrooms till the cows come home. No problem with that. <laughs> but I hate vacuuming. And he cooks too. He owns a restaurant. So I, I end up uh, doing the salads and he ends up doing all the meat. <laughs> but so, so I think you're right. Like the household duties are getting distributed. And I think more and more um, men and fathers are getting involved in helping to to balance the child rearing duties. But there is sort of that underlying attitude that, um, again, I just go back to the 1960s and 70s shows that I'm looking at. There's sort of this notion that 
I'm supposed to take care of my wife. This, this idea that it reflects on the man if he's not able to fully take care of his wife and kids. And I, the reason I want to raise that is because I just want to acknowledge it's not that long since we've been moving forward from those attitudes, but I wonder if that is part and parcel of some of the challenges that we see in some of the other countries where women don't have the same economic freedom as we do. And I, I don't know if you if you know uh, what is at the, at the heart of that, uh, because I think that is a, a really difficult societal norm that would be that would be very hard to overcome. Well, I mean, you know, most countries had what was called coverture laws at some point in time. So it stems from British law, where once a woman is married, they're considered to be covered under the law as property of their husband. So in England and all the former British colonies, uh, the U.S. had coverture laws. Um, the guardianship system in a lot of Middle Eastern countries is very similar, right? You are, you are essentially under the law property of your husband. Mm. And so you have no right. Um, so I guess the husband would have to take care of you. I'm not going to permit you to marry my daughter unless you can demonstrate that you're going to be able to take care of her. Um, because women couldn't, right? There's no, I always think about, you know, Jane Austen movies and how stressful it, it or Jane Austen books. <laughs> Most of my students have never read the books. They just watch movies. Um, but how stressful it is. The problem is always, I have all these unmarried daughters and my fortune is being given away to some strange male relative and my daughters aren't allowed to work and they're not allowed to do any of this and everything I worked for is going to go to somebody else what are we, what are we to do? Right. And so that's the system that we started with and we've moved a long way from that, but the remnants kind of those social norms are still existing. Hmm. And where does that come from? Because as you were talking, I, I watch a lot of Netflix, as you can tell, but <laughs> you, you got me thinking of Downton Abbey, which was such a strange um, uh, exposure to what the times used to be that you if you, you could have daughters, uh, but if you didn't have a male heir, it could be some stranger who comes in and, and inherits the, the family estate. Is there some good economic reason why those kinds of structures developed in the first place? So I haven't heard, I, I at least haven't read any kind of published work that is making an argument, but I suspect it has to do with trying to exert property rights over children, right? A woman knows who her children are, it's, I think a lot of that coverture is let's exert property rights over the womb in some sense. Um, that might be part of it, but I have no idea, but it's, it's not, it's almost everywhere, everywhere in the world, women started as property. Mm -hmm. um, there's really not a good example of a society where women had immediate equal rights. What is the breakthrough that has to happen in a society for women to start accumulating the kind of economic rights that we're going to be talking about in just a minute as being so important. Is there, is there some sort of moment that happens? Is it that notion that a, a woman is separate in her own right as her own person? Is it the, we've got all kinds of dower rights, um, historical uh, legal precedents that get set. I'm just trying to to figure out is we're, if we're talking about trying to address some of the underlying issues, you can't kind of leap forward to where we are from where some of these nations find themselves. What is the incremental step that's, that takes place? What's the first thing that's most important? So one thing that I noticed through my work is that countries that embrace liberty in general, even if they are not at first granting it to women, um, countries that do embrace markets, do embrace, um, you know, private property rights and, and economic freedom, even if they're only giving it to the men, those places are more likely to start giving those rights to women as well. So I think liberty is a pretty good starting point. Um, and if you think back to a lot of the classical liberals like John Stuart Mill um, and a lot of the, uh, the authors that wrote about the do commerce theory, I think Montesquieu would be one of them. Um, the classical liberals of you know the 17, 1800s, they wrote a lot about how markets have these civilizing effects on human mm -hmm. behavior. 
you go out into the market and in order to be successful in the market, you have to practice these virtues. You have to practice honesty and you have to establish a reputation that you're trustworthy. Um, you have to be more accepting of people who are different from you because if you're not willing to, you know, hire that employee who's a woman, well, it could be the case that you just missed out on the best employee of your life, right? And that's going to hurt your bottom line. So um, there's a lot of, of empirical evidence that countries that are more economically free tend to have more tolerant attitudes. Um, not just of you know women taking on non-traditional roles, but there are some studies that um, talk about how greater economic freedom is associated is associated with greater tolerance of you know homosexuals or greater tolerance of immigrants or people who have different religions from you. Um, so I do think that that you know the early classical liberals kind of identified that there are some civilizing aspects of markets where we become more tolerant of other people um, and then our, you know, through our process of exchange, you know, I get to learn that, you know, people aren't that different from me and then we can start to grant people more rights from there. When we start looking at some of these other countries, I guess I think I just take it for granted that markets exist everywhere. Uh, because you, you have to have the buying and selling of goods just for even uh, basic sustenance. Am I am I am I uh, fooling myself? <laughs> do, do markets exist everywhere? I is it just a, is it sort of a scale? Is it a scale of freedom? And so we're, is that what we're looking at, or is there are there places that are are just truly not free? I mean, even if you think about the USSR, right? There were markets. Even if we're talking about you know underground economy, right? We're always, no matter how hard you try to to quell the formal market, you're still going to see informal markets spring up. Um, so there will always be markets. Um, but when you have a lot of laws and rules that limit your choices and make it difficult for you to be entrepreneurial and make it difficult for you to make the choices that make sense to you to improve your own life, then you know that's, that's where those limits on economic freedom really start to affect our, our material well-being. Right? Because now choices are taken off the table. I have to jump through more regulatory burdens or hoops to get. So. It, it's interesting that we're having this conversation now when we've had such a un unprecedented uh, period of time where people have turned to the state for that social safety net. And I, I wonder I wonder if we're going to boomerang back to embracing freedom, embracing the choice, embracing the markets, embracing entrepreneurship, or if you can just get used to the, the somebody taking care of you. Do you, What are you going to be looking at, actually, as we go forward in this post-COVID era on that? Well, I think that, you know, the growth of the state in most countries has kind of exploded. And, you know, from the standpoint of somebody from the US, it started, well, it started with the war on drugs, really, but it really ramped up during the war on terror. So we're like 20 years into this big, massive growth of, of the role of the state in our lives. And just like, uh, you know, the great economist Robert Higgs says, anytime there's a crisis, that's an opportunity for the state to mm -hmm. kind of take on more and more and more. So we see that, um, you know, COVID is a really great example of how it's laying the, fa the groundwork for the state to make restrictions on how you're supposed to run your business uh, that didn't exist before, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if Canada's toying with ideas of vaccine passports and businesses, uh, you can't let people in that aren't vaccinated. Um, well, that, you know, whatever your stance about the, you know, the virus is, like you're telling somebody that they cannot serve customers that they might want to serve, or you're forcing them, that's just as bad as forcing them to serve people that they don't want to serve. Right? Um, so you're, you're kind of laying the groundwork for that. Um, and so we do see that in the United States a bit, too. In some places, there's that push for that. Um, the more we see the state take care of us, the less we kind of start caring about each other, kind of crowds out that aspect of our behavior, for sure. And, and I want to just add one more aspect to it as well, 
that uh, you've got consumer behavior being severely restricted. I think Emmanuel Macron in France wanted to disallow people who had not been vaccinated from even being able to buy food. And fortunately, the court stepped in and said no. So it's, it's fascinating to me that in uh, the nations where we had this foundation of liberty that you that you began with in creating all of the institutions that we need to create freedom and markets and wealth and prosperity, we're now seeing that erode. But let's go to the very beginning where there are some nations that that didn't de- that don't even have that yet particularly for women because one of the things that you you'd mentioned is so important in the study that you're looking at in your women in progress report was owning property and that's maybe uh, a sort of an interesting one because i think that's that's maybe some of the resistance that some feminists have to property rights is that women as you've just described um start out as property in in certain in in most of our societies uh t- tell me about this ownership of property and why that's so important for women to be able to have that about that ability as well what does that unleash it just allows you resources that you can control that you have the ability to transform those resources in a way that might better your life Right? It gives you the ability to improve your life through the choices that you make. If I can't own property, right, then I am completely relying on other people to take, because I have nothing. And I have nothing but what other people give me if I can't own my own property. Um, right? when I Once I own my own property, I could sell it, I can invest in it, I can build on it, right? I can go from there. Uh, but if I'm not allowed to own anything, then I don't have choices about how to live my life. Really, I view economic freedom as having control over your life's choices. It's control over how you spend your time, who you interact with. You know, really that's that's the essence to me of property rights and economic freedom. It's control over your choices. So extending from that, one of the other things you look at is being able to start a business. And I, I guess you're, you're quite right. I'm, I mean, if you can't own property, if you can't open a bank account, is it even possible to, to start a business? It seems like that is kind of the entry point to being to being able to, to be self-sustaining also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so um, a lot of countries that make it more difficult for women to register a business they might allow women to own property, they might allow them to have a bank account, but then when it comes to, okay, now I wanna open a business, there's restrictions on that. In some, like even European countries, there's restrictions on the type of jobs that women can do, right? So they can own property, they can travel freely, they can have a bank account, you can open a business, but you know, if you're in Belarus and you wanna work with pesticides, good luck if you're a woman, and maybe that's not my idea of a wonderful career of uh, working pest control, but for some women that might be their best choice. That might be their best opportunity to improve their lives. And who am I to cut them off from it just because I don't think that that's maybe a woman's job. And so you see a lot of those types of restrictions. We need to protect you. You, you can't work a job where you're lifting heavy objects. You can't work a job that, um, causes you to work at nighttime, right? So there's those types of labor market restrictions that aren't as, you know, egregious as saying you can't own property, but they're cutting off women's opportunities in in more subtle Mm -hmm. ways. And those are ways that actually limit our ability to change social norms. How can I be a trailblazer in a field that's not typically seen as a woman's field if I'm literally not allowed to enter into that field, how do we change the notion that that's a man's job, not a woman's job, if women aren't legally allowed to do it? I want to walk through a couple more of these things, because I, I think that when, you, when you've when you grown up with so much freedom, it's hard to imagine some of the restrictions that exist elsewhere. And you've mentioned a few of them. Um, talking about freedom to work, you talked about the um, certain types of jobs being closed to women, but also... Um, are are women in some cases not allowed to have jobs at all or not allowed to to, yeah. to work certain hours as well? Yeah, so there are some countries that um, you cannot obtain a job without at least having permission from your husband. So you need mm-hmm. to obtain 
explicit permission from your husband to be able to work outside of the home. Um, and so that gives your husband a whole lot of control over you uh, very much. And what would be the purpose of some of these, some of these, um, these restrictions? I'm trying to understand if it's, because sometimes um, if you've got this perception that there's only a limited number of jobs out there, then you limit the workforce so that those who have to provide for their, their, their wives and their children are able to secure the employment, number one, or able to secure, secure high enough wages to take care of everyone. Mm -hmm. is, is that what's motivating it or is there, is there something that I'm missing? Um, I mean, I, a lot of the countries that have those types of very severe restrictions on women working outside of the home, they do tend to be countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. And so there does seem to be kind of a cultural, maybe even religious component to that. I'm, I'm hesitant to say that it's completely religious. I don't know enough about the religion to make that call. But the pattern emerges that it's that part of the world. And to some extent, some countries in Southeast Asia as well, but I do think that there's some sort of, uh, there's something to be said for, for that fact that that pattern has emerged. Okay, so I want to make sure we go through each of these. We've talked about freedom to work, being able to be employed, and also the type of jobs you're employed in and hours of employment. We've talked about financial rights, being able to start business ventures. We've talked about some aspects of property rights, being able to manage resources, being able to invest in stealth, being able to inherit when, you, when you're assessing that on economic freedom, why does that matter for a woman to be able to inherit? I mean, I think we, we talked about Jane Austen and we talked about Downton Abbey, right? It's, um, you know, if I want to work hard, it, it destroys a little bit of the incentive for somebody who is successful to work even harder. Because if I, if I only have daughters and you know i feel like i've made my fortune if my daughters can't inherit what mm -hmm. i the fortune that i've made you know what's the incentive for me to continue to produce and continue to create um so i do think it you know property rights you know, in, inheritance is part of be, having a property right right um if i own a business and i am very successful I should be, if that's truly my property, I should be able to determine who gets that after I die. Right? And okay. so not having the ability to have my daughters inherit my property, then I don't really have full control over my property. Somebody else has a bit of control over it. I like the way you describe that too, because it goes to the first point you're raising is that liberty is the foundation. If they apply liberty to the decisions of men, then it extends to women. And so there's a symbiotic relationship is that both, the both parties need to have that kind of freedom. Let's go on to a couple of other ones. Freedom of movement. Um, tell me the ways in which we don't see parity in the genders in, in some countries that, 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 uh, that, that you've had a chance to look at. Yeah, so some countries um, like Sudan and Egypt, they have limitations on women's ability to get a passport in the same way that men. So men have a lot easier time getting a passport. Um, there's limitations on their ability to travel outside of the country on their own or within the country on their own. Uh, in some places that have the guardianship system, you need a male family member to be with you if you're leaving the home. Um, and so, you know, being able to choose where to live, being able to move where there might be economic opportunities for me, all of that's limited if my freedom of movement is limited. And as and I said before, you can't escape a bad situation if you're not allowed to leave. And I think that's also then tied to legal status and legal rights. So, so give me the range of things that you look at there, because we started off by saying that in many countries, women start off as property, but that would also very likely then have severe limitations on if they did have some legal challenge they wanted to take forward, their, their likelihood of being able to access justice, access the courts. Yeah, so in some countries, um, one of the variables that we used to have in the earlier editions of the gender disparity measures is, um, does a woman's testimony in court carry the same weight as a man? And so in some countries, the testimony of a woman only counts as like half of the testimony of a man. Um, can you declare, can you be the head of household officially? Can, if you're, a, there's some countries where a woman cannot be the head of household. It has to be a male that is declared the head of household. Um, mm -hmm. 
there are countries where I can't sign a contract if I'm a woman, right? So I can't make, you know, mutually beneficial voluntary exchanges because I'm a woman and that's the ability to have a contract be upheld in court. And I could make deals, but whoever I enter into an agreement with could totally screw me over because it's not going to be upheld in court. Now here's a t sensitive topic because we're, we're, we're having this debate and discussion now about whether it's if Western values and sort of Western white European culture is um, systemically racist is, are we, oh, do we come from a paradigm in the West where we think that the way we do things is the right way. And we're kind of having a cultural imposition when we start talking about these concepts. Are these everyone concepts? Should it, should it matter? Can we divorce it from, from Western culture, from Western white culture? Should, is there a way to, to sort of neutralize the topic? So as we start talking about some of these countries, people are going to see, hmm, those are a lot of those countries are in Africa or the Middle East. And, and how, do you, how do you address that in a culturally sensitive way? Well, first, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the West had those same type of laws. They weren't mm -hmm. unique to that part of the world. Um, that part of the world still has them in place, but that is not a unique type of law to have restrictions on women's rights. That's everywhere. Um, and so I think that's one starting point, right? Because everybody had those types of rules in place. And if you think about, even in the United States, as late as the 1980s, there were restrictions on women's ability to have a credit card in her name without getting permission from her husband. So it's not like it was that long ago where we got rid of at least the formal remnants of this system. Right. So I, that's one way to, to kind of think about it. The other way to think about it in terms of it being an everybody problem um, is that when women aren't able to participate in the economy, that comes at a huge opportunity cost to society as a whole, right? Their ideas, what they could have contributed are not being shared with the rest of the world. I think about my sister, she's brilliant. She's an anesthesiologist. She's like my hero, she's amazing. And I think about you know how much worse off the world would be if she wasn't able to do what she does. If we lived in a world where she wouldn't be able to, you know, treat patients and help contribute to saving lives, that we would be worse off for that. Um, There's such a strong connection between your economic um, opportunities, ability, and um, and and the ability to, to 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 exercise that to the full extent, and the number of kids that you have. And I wonder, as we're looking through the lens of what's happening in some of these other countries, is it a chicken and egg problem? Is it that we've got many countries where you've got a very high number of children being born to women, which then necessitates them prioritizing child rearing over pursuing economic rights? Or is it the reverse? Is it that you need to have the economic freedom to be able to pursue um, a sort of out of home income in order to have the ability to have fewer children because you've got more family means to take care of yourself? How, how, should, how should we approach that issue? Have you, have you overlaid when we look at some of these jurisdictions what family size is? So I haven't really looked too much at family sizes, but I do know that there's a pretty strong correlation that higher per capita incomes are correlated with lower birth rates, right? Lower population growth rates. So wealthier countries seem to have fewer children. Um, part of that might be if you're in a poorer society, you need a lot of children. They're helping you do the farming. They're helping you meet that subsistence level of living. Um, and that was true for the US and for Canada in, you know, early 1900s even, right? Families had lots of kids. Not all of those kids were expected to live to adulthood. I think my grandmother, her name is Rose. She was named after her older sister who passed away. She had a huge family, right? You, you weren't, ex not all of those children were expected to make it to adulthood, but they were also contributing to household production and contributing, um, you know, income, having jobs. So part of that is necessity as we started to develop, um, you know, 
we saw child labor drop before we had child labor laws in place because once we started to have higher per capita incomes we didn't need as many kids they didn't have to work mm -hmm. we could start educating them um, once we have even higher per capita incomes we don't just have to educate our sons now we have the extra money to start edu educating our daughters too um, so i do think part of it is just kind of a natural path of economic development Right. As we have our, as we become wealthier, we tend to have fewer children, but the, the, you know, hand in hand with having a lot of children is who's going to carry that responsibility. And it's almost always going to be the woman. Well, that's important too, because there's, I guess, a couple of ways when you're transitioning from a more agriculture based society, you can develop new techniques that allows your farm to be more productive. That's one way of generating wealth, but there's also an urbanization aspect too. And as we look at, at these countries, is, is that a, a factor that we should be considering is that the more likely that the women are living in a situation where they're in an agriculture environment or maybe doing subsistence farming, that's where you're also going to see that they don't have the same economic freedoms? Um, I do know that there's a paper by, I believe, Alberto Alessina and a couple of co-authors from a few years ago that looked at uh, the relationship between kind of traditional farming practices and how that has carried over into the modern day uh, that it influences gender norms and attitudes towards women working outside of the home um, because that the, some of those traditional farming practices, particularly use of the plow, well, that was physically demanding. And so it started to necessitate a division of labor that kept women in the home and men outside of it. Um, and so I think there's definitely a linkage there. All right. Now let's talk then. So we've gone through the different types of components that you look at. And there is a good news story here when you're looking at gender parity, that there are 57 countries in the world that have gender parity. And I I, I want to I just want to see if there's any nuance that we should be looking um, at there, because Canada is on that list of, yeah. of 57 countries. But the uh, but but give me some something that stands out for you about about so those 57. Canada's on that list and the U.S. is on that list, but so is Venezuela and some other countries that are not considered to be economically free. So having equal rights for men and women does not necessarily mean that that country is free. So in Venezuela, men and women are just equally unfree. There's no additional restrictions on what women can do. So that's one thing to notice that just because there's equal rights between men and women doesn't mean freedom, right? That doesn't necessarily mean overall freedom. It just means no additional restrictions for women. Oh. Um, All right. And then when you look at other countries as a whole, are, are you able to get data for all the countries, because it looks to me like you, when you look at the sort of the five year tranches, I want to understand where you're getting the data from and how it's changed over time, because uh, you do make a, a sort of a methodological note that there is an adjustment downward at one point mm -hmm. is not necessarily a retrenchment or, or moving backwards on women's rights. It's, it's really more data became available. So tell us sort of the, the nature of the of the of the data set that we're looking at. So the data set that I use, I get from the World Bank. So the World Bank puts together um, a report every year called Women, Business, and the Law, or every other year. It used to be every other year. They're going to be releasing it every year now. And so Women, Business, and the Law, it looks at the aspects of economic freedom that I, that I talk about, but it also looks at a lot of other things, um, like what kind of... Um, you know, maternity leave, what kind of, you know, other kind of entitlements. I take anything in that uh, data set, I focus just on the things that can be considered economic freedoms from kind of a negative rights perspective, um, freedom from having anybody intervene on my ability to make those choices. Uh, go ahead. Okay. And then we look at a scale of one to 10. Am I, am I, do I have that? So those 57 I, countries would be, I look at, a would scale be at from the top. Zero to one. Zero to one, pardon me. So yeah. the ones who are the 57 countries that have parity, it's uh, one, one to one. So mm -hmm. when we're looking at um, those, as you start moving down towards zero, what are the kinds of things that, that you're seeing are problem for some of the middle set? And then we'll talk about the bottom set in a minute. So the middle set, the ones that kind of score in like the 0 0.8, 0 0.9 range, 
Uh, those are countries that tend to have little labor market restrictions that I was mm -hmm. talking about before, right? Women can't work these same hours. They can't work jobs that are deemed dangerous or, um, you know, carry heavy equipment. Um, so those labor market restrictions, typically um, some South American countries and some European countries, if they're scoring below one, it's typically because they have a handful of those labor market restrictions. And it's sort of an interesting way you've described it because I'm sure in those societies, they're probably not looking at it as they're disadvantaging their women. They're probably looking at it as they're, they're protecting their women from, from being exposed to, in the case you mentioned, pesticides, something that might harm them or work that, that, that might hurt them as well. So it's, it's sort of a different type of motivation um, for, for the countries that are in the, the point eight to point it's nine. Almost all, almost all of those labor market restrictions are kind of motivated by uh, you know, protecting women's reproductive health. Um, and, and it's not even you know, tr necessarily true that lifting something heavy is going to harm <laughs> your reproductive health. That's kind of an old, false. <laughs> well, these days with the with the equipment that we have available to us, almost every job we, with uh, yeah. robotics and, and and heavy machinery is it that also helps to to level the playing field. Let's move down a little bit then. So when you start seeing in the um, say 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 range, what are the things that are that are still persistently um, problematic in, in those societies where, where we don't have gender parity. Those are the ones where we start to get into on top of labor market restrictions, we're going to start limiting freedom of movement. We're going to start limiting your ability to um, open businesses and engage in contracts. Um, and then when you move to the even lower numbers, there's just restrictions across the board. Um, the property rights restrictions and the inheritance laws restrictions, those typically only appear for the countries that are way at the bottom of the list. And let's talk about some of those countries at the bottom of the list, because you do a list of, of 15. Is there some reason why you've, you've sort of identified that, that particular group? Just give us the context there. I think that was the cutoff. So a lot of countries end up with the same score. Yeah. And so when there's natural breaks in the data is when I kind of cut off the list. So I think 15, there was a kind of a natural break in the data there. So let's na name them if you, do you have the, the list in front of you? I can pull the list up in front of so me. If, I have, if you don't I have the, the list from the previous report, but I also have the list of data that will be published in the Economic Freedom of the World Index oh. of this month. So I have the newest data if you'd like to. Yes, that. please <laughs> give us the newest data. I thought perhaps because, um, yeah, I, I thought the, it looked like you were getting data every five years. So I wasn't sure if we needed, if we had something more up to date, but if you do, I, tell I us. I have been getting data every other year. And you had mentioned that kind of artifact in the data that some years we would have more variables available, but the World Bank actually went back and refined this data set. So now there's data from every year from 1970 through 2020 um, for pretty much every country in the world. And every country, we have data for every variable that we have now. So when I look at the global average, right, in 1970, the global average was about 0.7. In 80, it was 0.74. In 90, it was 0.75. In the 2000s, it was 0.8. And in the 20 teens, it was 0.84. So now we do see this, you know, optimistic outcome that the world as a whole has become much more equitable over the past you know, several decades. Um, and so if we're talking about some of the countries that are still performing poorly in terms of women's rights, um, Sudan is the country at the bottom of the list right mm -hmm. now. So um, Sudan has a score of about 0.29. So that's our lowest. The, as low as you can go is zero. Um, so we never have a country, just like in the regular Economic Freedom of the World Index, you never have a country that's completely uh, centrally planned. So you never have anything that is all the way the lowest score that you could possibly have. Um, but Sudan, women can't get a passport the same way. They can't travel outside of the country. They can't work the same jobs. Uh, they can sign a contract, but they can't work a lot of jobs. <laughs> Huh. And they can open up a bank account, uh, you know, but they can't inherit. They can own some property, but they can't inherit any property. 
so. uh, talk, give me another, another example, name off a couple more and give me another one that stands out for you, because I, I'll ask sort of the second question of what, what implications that does have on, on GDP. Cause I think there's a strong relationship you'd mentioned earlier. So what's yeah. another example, just paint a life, the life day in the life of a woman <laughs> living in one of these countries that is at the, the lower end of the list. What, what other oh, things can oh, they not oh, do? A lot of other countries, you know, Egypt, um, Jordan, Iran, Gabon, a lot of these countries, they have similar restrictions. It's just in terms of how many do they have, right? Sudan happens to have the most, even though they do actually let you own uh, immovable property as a woman. That, when you start to look at the Middle East, um, that that area tends to restrict women's property rights more um, more severely. So, so what is the connection with economic freedom? Some of those countries are difficult because they get so much of their wealth from oil production. I, I'm thinking in the case of Iran or Iraq or United Arab Emirates and Oman and others. And I'm, I'm wondering how you separate out the GDP per capita or how you compare it with, with, um, with the impact that the restrictions on, on one gender is having. How, how, do you, how do you tease that data out? So there's a great study that I like to refer back to by um, Tegner. Teeg I never know how to pronounce the name. Um, I apologize to the author <laughs> for butchering the name. But Tegner and Kuberis, there was a paper in 2014 where they kind of put an estimate on how much per capita GDP are we losing when, we, when women aren't able to fully participate in the economy. Um, and so for countries where there's a lot of restrictions, uh, they say it can detract up to about 27% of GDP. Mm -hmm. You're missing out on, on about 27%. So for a country like Saudi Arabia, where you know per capita income in the most recent year is a little over $20,000 per person, um, having those gender restrictions is costing everybody over um, almost $5,500 mm -hmm. a year, a little over $5,400 a year per person. I definitely would like an extra $5,400. I would help me out a lot. Uh, so, you know, these are real costs because when you're restricting women's economic freedom, you are shrinking the scope of the market. You are making it smaller, which means there are fewer gains from trade to be had and there are fewer, you know, um, opportunities to benefit from the talent and the ideas of the individuals you're cutting off. Do you economy. do you think then though that lends itself to the argument that others would make the GDP is a poor measure of the overall health of an economy that maybe we need to develop new measures in order to take into account the unpaid labor that we see uh, so so many women doing in in all societies and it, you know it's, it's a larger number of hours or a smaller number of hours depending on some of the other aspects we've talked about but it is is GDP still the right measure. So I, I teach intermediate macro, and I think this is a conversation that I actually had been getting into with my students yeah, uh, last yesterday, last class, um, just talking about some of the feminist criticisms of per capita GDP, um, just like, you know, that unpaid labor doesn't count. If I hire, um, if I hire a housekeeper, or send my kids to daycare, that same service does count towards GDP. But if I do those things myself, it doesn't. And so it does start to impact how comparable, you know, GDP figures are when we're looking at developed countries where we do outsource a lot of this work to other people uh, versus developing countries where a lot of people are doing all of that stuff themselves. So, so I do think there's lots of criticisms that we can make of GDP as a measure of productivity. There's a lot of criticisms we can make of per capita GDP as a measure of living standards. But the alternative living measures of living standards, like um, the human development indicators, um, they're all very highly correlated with mm -hmm. per capita GDP. So even if per capita GDP isn't really covering everything, those outcomes that we care about when we think this is what it means to be a developed country, all of those things are, are much, they're very highly correlated with GDP. So and I higher think this per capita is, GDP means you have them. 
And this is why that's important because it's not just about dollars. Every time you talk about dollars, I don't know why some people find that alienating, but we, I think we have to draw the greater connection to what that means for human development, for human happiness, for human health. And you do a couple of, of those measures when you're when you're looking at the difference between those countries that have that score lower on the index versus, versus those who are at the top. And one thing that strikes me is life expectancy as a, for instance. So yeah. I don't know if you have updated numbers on this, but in the last report, it was um, in the, in the high, uh, in the, in the countries where you do have a high level of gender parity, it, the life expectancy is 83 in mm -hmm. the lower ones. It's 67. That's a 15 year age difference. Yes. And if you would ask me if I want 15 extra years on my life, yes, I do. I absolutely do. Um, one thing that you notice is women tend to live a little bit longer than men on average. That's just naturally women's life expectancy is, is a bit uh, higher than, than men's. In the countries where we're talking about little economic freedom, the life expectancies are pretty close. But as you move to more economic freedom, you start to see that natural spread where women are living a lot longer mm -hmm. than men. Um, not a lot longer, really about like five years, but, um, so men do better, their life expectancy is higher when they're living under, uh, economically free, uh, institutions as well. Um, but it's only about, it's about 14 years of a difference as well from the least free to the, the most free. What, what is happening there? Can you, are you able to, to connect some dots about what happens when you don't have the same economic opportunity or the same level of wealth? Why does it have such a dramatic impact on life expectancy? I think in some of the least free countries, we're talking about countries where you, you know, per capita income might be a couple hundred dollars a year, right? And so you are able to afford just basic subsistence. I can get maybe enough food to eat, maybe a couple of, you know, changes of clothes but nothing really beyond that. Mm -hmm. Once you start to have a higher per capita income, well, now you have enough to eat. Now you might be able to afford better health care. Um, you might be able to you know, work fewer hours and have healthier sleeping habits, like all of these things that might impact your, your health um, and impact your life expectancy. They are correlated with you know, economic freedom and more economic freedom comes with more per capita income. Do you have also statistics on um, maternal health or child mortality? Is that a factor too? Yeah, so countries where um, women are economically free, the most free countries, uh, maternal mortality rates are you know 13 women per every 100,000 births will die. We'll see 13, a little over 13 deaths for every 100,000 births. Um, which isn't very much, uh, but when we look at the least free countries, you see over 340 deaths mm -hmm. per 100,000 births. So it's a massive difference in maternal mortality rates. You are much more likely to die in childbirth in some of the least economically free countries. That is remarkable. And it's it's so interesting because it wasn't that long ago as we where we started off that we were having those same very high rates of of I mean, uh, it's of, still of one of the most death. dangerous things you could do as a woman i live in texas texas has the highest rate of maternal mortality in the us so you know that and texas does have a tendency to restrict uh, women's freedoms especially when it comes to their own reproductive choices isn't that interesting so explain the connection there for me why why is it that the more a woman is able to have access to economic opportunities the less likely it is she is to die in childbirth is it because it's simply because she's having fewer children so there's fewer opportunities for something to go wrong i mean if you're going to have 10 or 12 children, there's each one of those times that you have a child is going to put you at risk? Or is it that you you just have access to, to better healthcare because your society is growing wealthier and so there's more modern medicines and so you're able to prevent some of that? What is the, what is the, what's the factor that's happening there? I think a lot of it, a lot of that heavy lifting is, is in terms of living standards. Economic mm -hmm. freedom raises the living standards. <clears throat> And in places where living standards are higher, you have better access to healthcare. 
But, you know, one of the reasons I brought up Texas is because the United States, you know, we have you know, pretty high living standards and access to, to decent health care. Um, but Texas has a lot of limitations on women's ability to choose whether or not they would actually like to carry a pregnancy. And so when you force women, you take that choice off of the table, right, you are more likely to have women um, carry pregnancies to term that they would rather not carry to term mm-hmm. that might have been dangerous for them. It's so interesting because I think there actually just was a change in Texas it law, was wasn't there? This morning. This it was. Morning, as yes. Of, you know, midnight. September 1st, if you are, you know, if a heartbeat can be detected, you are unable to uh, terminate the pregnancy. So that's a six week bar, a six week bar, right? That's a six week bar. And the majority of women have no idea they're pregnant at that point in time. So it is, it is effectively um, an outright ban. And on top of that, they have actually done something really bizarre where they've enabled uh, the average, they've empowered citizens to sue anybody who helps a woman get an abortion beyond that six week limit. So if your Uber driver takes you somewhere, um, you know, somebody you don't even know could sue your Uber driver for up to $10,000 for taking you um, to have access to abortion care. You know, it's so, it's so interesting because this, this goes to the issue of democracy and it goes to the issue of what it is that, the people are asking for because um, it, you wouldn't normally expect a reversal once you've got an establishment of those rights. But even talking more broadly about some of the nations that we're talking about where they haven't even got to the first steps of economic freedom, is it because there's something wrong with the political process? Is it that there is no political mechanism to push the the, the freedoms forward? Is it that the women are not asking for it yet, or they're not asking for it in large enough numbers. I'm trying to figure out what what is the push that that causes the movement to go one way or the other, whether it's the the the, the extension of of more gender parity or whether it's the retraction of it. Yeah, so that is a big question, and that's a question that I'm because I live in Texas and because I care about women's issues. This has become you know something that I'm very interested in exploring more about. Um, I don't know that I have a good answer to that question, Mm -hmm. but what I think it does raise the issue that we can't be too complacent with the rights that we do have. Even if we think that we have come so far, um, there's always the chance that some of it can slip away here and there. And so um, so that's one of the reasons why I encourage people who care about women's rights to actually consider markets as a solution, as an as a very viable, essential element of you know protecting women and and helping them achieve you know, uh, you know flourishing, human flourishing. So so let's talk then about if we can connect this to how it is that industrialized and wealthy nations can help because we we have these mechanisms you mentioned the world bank is where you get your statistics but the united nations i suppose in theory has a committee that is supposed to be looking at women's rights but you, you look at the po- who's on that committee and often it's the worst offenders i think saudi arabia was it was was placed on that committee not so long ago and and you just have to wonder if there's um, something wrong with our international institutions in trying to to make uh, real progress in this area. Do, is it through those kind of multilateral international institutions that we're able to get the most progress? That would be one part of it. Because the other side you could look at is there are a number of different nonprofit agencies. I, I look at, I'm involved in Rotary Club as a, for instance, which uh, has a lot of exchanges with Rotary Clubs around the world, is on a polio eradic- eradication program, but there's also volunteers that go and help in the in the instances where there's calamities that happen in different jurisdictions. There's also uh, things like microcredit, different um, providing micro loans to, to, to women so that they can get that first start in the in in entrepreneurship and so when you're looking at what's the best way to help I, let me put another one on the table is it 
is it is it providing those maternal health supports uh, because being able to have limitations on family and being able to control the number of children you have is is also a factor in being able to enter the workforce or is it i'm going to put a bunch on the table here for you rosemary <laughs> or is it uh, investing in education because if you've got children going to school that also frees up um, mom to be able to work. And it also creates the opportunity for girls to get educated and see that there's other opportunities. It's, it's always tricky to know where's the best way to intervene. Do you, do you have some thoughts on that? So I have a thought that you didn't toss out there. Um, it, and, and it's uh, what we sometimes refer to as kind of soft power, which is really just trade. Right. When we trade with people, we're not just exchanging goods and services. We are exchanging bits and pieces of our culture and our attitudes. And so um, one of the best ways to kind of demonstrate, hey, there is another way of doing things is through through trade, um, you know, goods, services, entertainment. Right. All of those things are going to kind of spread bits and pieces of, of culture that might be more open. To, to women taking on less traditional roles. Um, so I think that's a really important and avenue that we often overlook. Like when I know with everything that's going on in Afghanistan, I'm very concerned about the women there um, because there's already tons of reports of them losing rights and, and not being able to go to school and, and many horrible, horrible things. Um, and one of the things that a lot of countries are talking about is imposing economic sanctions. And I think that, you know, that, you know, the people in power are always going to be able to take and get whatever they need. When you impose economic sanctions, you're hurting the people mm -hmm. that you really should be trying to help. You're not just hurting the people in power. You're hurting the people that live there. Oh, it's so interesting because that creates... That I mean, that, there's a, a huge area of discussion about that, which I wanted to get into, into with you. I'm glad you mentioned that because you you have this notion that you should only trade with those nations who match your level of respect for human rights. Um, and there's there's a whole variety of, of examples that we could give and not just women's rights, but let's keep it focused on women's rights for a bit. And so if you've said that, you want, it's almost like you're suggesting that you you double down is that those nations that have the worst rights are the ones that you want to engage with and trade the most, because that's where you sort of get the, the cultural norms changing once there's the exposure to, to other nations. It seems it seems so counterintuitive. Maybe yeah. make that argument for us uh, again, for those who, who might still be doubting. Um, so, I mean, again, it has to do with that do commerce theory that I had brought up earlier is that when we're engaging in market exchanges, we have to practice certain virtues like mm. tolerance and honesty. Um, but also when we're trading with people, when we're trading with people that are different from us, we're not just exchanging the goods and services, we're exchanging parts of our attitudes. Um, you know, exporting entertainment is a really hugely important one, because if you live in a country where your rights are pretty restricted, if you can see some television shows and movies of how people live and how women are treated in other parts of the world, that could be really eye opening for you. Watching a television show where a woman is a president or a doctor or a lawyer, that can give you the idea that this is something that is on the table for you as a woman. This is something you can do. I had never, it never occurred to me that I could be an economist. It never occurred to me until somebody said, hey, you know, one of my professors was like, hey, maybe you should major in this. But it didn't strike me as something that was, you know, on the table for me until I saw other women do it. You know, um, so I think that that kind of like representation in the media. And so, you know, trading, trading our cultural exports can be very, very important not just goods and services. You just reminded me of a funny story. I read Margaret Thatcher's biographies, autobiographies, and she tells a story about her son, Mark, being asked in class what he wanted to be when he grew up. And he said he wanted to be a lorry driver. He wanted to be a truck driver. And the teacher asked, well, don't you want to be prime minister? He said, well, well can boys be prime minister? <laughs> he, oh, that's true. Anyway, I thought it was a hilarious story because it kind of well, reversed. His mom was, oh my gosh, that's so great. <laughs> That was a good one. But, you know, it is interesting because I wonder if technology is going to then solve much of the problems because it's funny how many times we've made cultural references in the course of talking about how things have changed. And you, you, it's got me thinking that 
if you can get broadband, high speed internet access around the world, and everybody can carry their device and have access to to anything they want to see, what a what a remarkable change that would make. And so when you're thinking and of the, the best why ways, just try so hard to control it. Sometimes, if you want to control the citizens, that you know, controlling access to the internet is one thing that seems essential. And so it does control. And so it does make me wonder then. So you've talked about trade. So if if you've got a foreign aid uh, priority, uh, maybe I've just come to my 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 own answer on on thinking that. I I wonder if it's if it's creating this infrastructure um, that is is going to be the most important, so that then the exposure to uh, all of these different uh, different different cultures and different values that we've talked about it would happen organically that almost seems to be the problem as we we try to to push things from the top down maybe there's something more especially if you believe in markets of trying to find mechanisms to get changed pushed from the bottom up and you've talked about trade but even trade that is government led you need to have your your government willing to have a trade agreement and a trade relationship with another government. Is there is there some more grassroots way that, that you can have that kind of trade exchange or cultural exchange without having to rely on, on a government to government relationship? Yeah, I don't view trade as a government to government interaction. Really? The government, because whenever I'm buying things on Amazon, I'm not buying from the government, I'm buying from an individual on the other side of the world, right? Trade is an individual thing. Governments make rules about which individuals can and cannot trade with each other. But to me, trade is very much people trading with people. Um, and sometimes the government stands in the way of that. So I see trade as being kind of that grassroots organic activity that we could, you know, influence people's opinions. Um, another thing, and this would require the government, um, you know, I, I think that allowing people to move to move into your country, if they are unhappy with where they're at, allowing people to immigrate into your country um, could be life saving for them. Right. right? Accepting refugees. Right. Um, that that is something that, you know, would be a big help. And as governments would start to see their populations dwindle, they might rethink how they treat their people. I'd love to know a couple more examples that you'd have. As, as you're talking, I was thinking I, I just started investing in a, a company called Jumia. And what it is, is it's marketed as the, the Amazon of Africa. And <laughs> so I'm quite interested to see how it develops over time because that facilitating that kind of trade relationship, if you think that that is, is absolutely core in addressing some of these uh, liberty and equity issues that we're talking about. I, I, it just, I wonder what we're going to see over time. But um, uh, accepting refugees becomes problematic when you have to wonder about, do we have the capacity to have as many individuals come to the freer countries as would want to come here? And how do you, how do you, how do you, I mean, I don't know if you do much work on that front, but it, it does go to government policy about how you make those kinds of decisions, because I completely agree with you, especially since we are seeing the richer countries have lower birth rates, but they have very robust social welfare safety nets, which yeah. requires more taxpayers. And so many countries, uh, maybe not America as much, but certainly Canada, has has really expanded the the the, uh, the number of individuals that, that 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 can come to and become citizens and i'm, I'm wondering um just how, how you how you assess that and and prioritize that when you're looking at um through the lens of of uh, of gender is there a way of of prioritizing to those countries that are the worst off is that how you would kind of approach it um i mean i definitely I am somebody who is going to take a stance where I think, um, you know, people, ideas and goods should move freely across borders and there really hmm. shouldn't be any kind of restriction. I think, you know, like Julian Simon, humans are the ultimate resource. And so the more people we have, the more we can produce, the more ideas we have um, circulating. I see humans as being like purely beneficial 
uh, especially in the long run. I know in the short run there can be you know some infrastructure constraints. I know in the U.S. we we have a housing shortage as a lot of people have moved from cities into the suburbs. Our housing prices are going up, and so a big influx of immigration would you know complicate some of those problems. I know that a lot of liberty minded people tend to be worried that immigrants that come from countries that are less free will carry over those values hmm. so that when they're voting and making, you know, when they become citizens and they're making decisions here, they're going to want to impose institutions that are consistent with less freedom. Um, but the empirical evidence on that it su suggests the opposite, right? The people who want freedom are leaving their country to the more to go to the more free country because that's where they want to be. And so you don't actually see the effect of people kind of uh, bringing their you know, poor institutions along with them. And and what you just said has it, it rings so true with me. And that's maybe the other uh, side of the coin. Is there a danger that the that we are uh, the people who would be pushing for freedom in the country of their birth are, if you pull them out of the mix, does it then make those countries less free? Because you don't have the people sort of pushing at the edges to try to be the activist, to push government to go in the right direction. Or maybe it's the reverse. Maybe it's just that you're you're seeing this growth in freedom across the board around the world, regardless of the movement of people. And there, there seems to be some evidence of that. You have to tell me if you've got updated figures. I just want to go through this last one where you talk about 83 countries in between this short, relatively short period, 2016 to 2018, had seen, seen an increase of, of freedom. But then you saw 54 that saw a, a, de a decrease in that in that kind of uh, economic freedom for women. So I look at those numbers and it's not entirely clear to me if there's a, a story that can be told with that. Can, it, what, yeah. what, is the, what is the story you tell when you look at those numbers? So to me, I, I agree, there, there isn't kind of a geographical pattern that jumped out at me, um, but it's really the countries that started to add additional restrictions are ones that have adopted new labor restrictions mostly. Mm -hmm. And the ones that have improved economic freedom for women are ones that have moved away from those types of labor restrictions. A lot of the big change are those, uh, what types of jobs can women do? Okay. So when we look internationally, I'm glad we, d we discussed it this way, because uh, I wonder if we bring it closer to home, what it is that we should be focusing on closer to home as women, because it, it, uh, it I, I think I, I told you off the air that I don't consider myself a feminist. And maybe it's because I, I grew up with a mom who had already paved away all the barriers for me. And so I've never felt like I had any barriers to any job that I ever wanted. I never felt like there was a glass ceiling on what I could earn. I've had wonderful male mentors who <laughs> ensured that I had pay equity with the men in the same type of job. And so I, I feel like, boy, we've ticked off a lot of boxes here. Maybe we should be focused on helping women around the world get to the same level that we are at, rather than trying to manufacture statistical differences that can be explained in the way that you talked about. Maybe maybe I'm being too negative about the what I perceive to be um, the, the, the positioning of the feminist movement here, but, but what kind of conclusions when you look internationally, what kind of conclusions do you draw about what, what the, uh, what the, what the North American feminist movement should be focused on? I think, um, the North American feminist movement, as I said before, is really focusing on kind of narrowing those labor market disparities, that gender wage gap. Um, that's what we're focused on. And the way that, nor that the feminists focus on those goals is through laws that restrict economic freedom. So one of the things that I tr always try to point out is that if economic freedom is associated with all of these things that we like, like longer lives and healthier lives, uh, you know, higher rates of education, um, these are things we find desirable economic freedom helps achieve those, you are trying to achieve, you know, equality by reducing economic freedom, you might be shooting yourself in the foot, you might be really making a big mistake. So think very carefully about whether that's the, the hmm. route that you actually want to go. Um, because there's case studies in some countries where they have 
you know, gender quotas on corporate boards, some countries saw, you know, performance of those companies plummet and stock values plummet. Some countries saw an improvement, right? But it's a mixed bag. There's not clear evidence that those types of policies are actually achieving equality. Um, I think all you need to do is look at Scandinavia, right? They're considered, they have all of the laws in place that feminists want. Um, but in terms of gender equality, there's still huge gaps between men and women entering in the STEM field. There's a ton of women that are, you know, stay at home caregivers, um, basically because you've made that choice easier for them. They're getting paid to do it in a way that they weren't being paid to do it before. Um, we see the same thing in the U.S. Uh, California had changed its uh, maternity leave laws uh, recently, a couple of years ago. And it, you know, what happened is, you know, it subsidizes women making the choice to stay out of the labor market longer. Uh, so I don't know if that's the outcome we want, um, but I think that if we care about, um, you know, women's well-being, you know, health, education, labor market success, there's a very clear relationship between those positive outcomes and economic freedom. And when we try to achieve equality by getting rid of economic freedom, we don't know what we're buying with that. So what would be a policy that would promote economic freedom that would address some of these issues? I guess what I'm thinking is that there's a lot of great careers and in the STEM area, science, technology, engineering, math, is the approach then to try to identify those high paid occupations where there aren't the same number of women in them. And then, I don't know, um, encourage some wealthy entrepreneur to set up a scholarship fund to encourage women to get into that line of, of work. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways that you can uh, identify where the issue is in a real way and then promote that economic access that you're talking about with uh, without saying it has to be a government solution. I'm, I'm trying to, that, that's just sort of one example. I know in, in uh, my home jurisdiction, there's a lot of work to get women looking at jobs in trades because as we've discussed, the, uh, because they are so technological now and you can run heavy equipment off of just a, a, a dashboard, there, there really isn't the same kind of barriers to doing heavy physical labor as there was in the past. And so as a result, there are, industry groups that are trying to find ways to promote to women that there are really good paying jobs in those skilled professions. And so those are the kind of things that I'm thinking about, but I wonder if you've got some more thoughts about, yeah, we've I talked about the things that we should, the government shouldn't do. What are some of the things that, yeah. that entrepreneurs society, should do? Civil society, there's a huge role for, you know, civil society, philanthropists to kind of step in there. Uh, but I still come back to the conclusion that if we don't change gender norms, if we don't work on those, it doesn't matter if you're offering scholarships to those lucrative, you know, the training that would allow you to achieve that lucrative career. Are you going to drop out of that career path as soon as you have kids? Hmm. Right? What's going to, if we don't change the norms, then yes, I've obtained the education, but am I going to follow through with that job? So then maybe we reverse it and you go back and look at the professions that are dominated by women and you say, is there an opportunity to encourage more men to go in those yeah. professions, teaching and nursing as a maybe as a for instance, I don't know if that would if that gets to the same goal. It's one of those things where it's hard to tell whether the reason we don't have the gender parity is because uh, of the choices people make and they're happy with it but it's the academics who are uncomfortable with it. <laughs> I mean, at some point, at some point is it, it is what it is. And we've gotten as far as we, as, as society is prepared to go and nobody is pushing for additional changes. I don't know how you, how you make that, how you make that judgment of when, when you've arrived, when, when are we done? When, is, when do we have success? <laughs> um, I mean, I think some modern feminists would say we don't have success until we ha we get rid of that gender wage gap or, um, you know, and, and as I said, I think that the goal to a lot of modern feminists is to insulate women from the cost of some of the choices that they're making, insulate them from the trade-offs. I want to have kids, but I also want to have the high paying career. And if I take time off of work, 
to raise my kid for a year. I want to guarantee that my job is still going to be there waiting for me, right? That's really putting a lot of burden on other people. Um, and I think, so from my perspective as somebody who never wanted to have kids, when you have mandates in place, you've basically forced me into your choices because I, if, if there's no mandates in place, I can maybe make some contractual agreements with my employer. I don't plan on having kids. If I change my mind, I'm going to bear that financial responsibility, um, you know, in exchange for a higher salary now, please, you know, I'll bury that. I'll carry that cost on my own. If I change my mind, um, in a world where they're mandated to pay me, I don't have the ability to even negotiate some other arrangement. Mm -hmm. I have to live a life that assumes I have the same preferences as the majority of people when I don't. Thank you so much for the conversation today. It's been illuminating. Is there anything else that you should let us know that you're you're looking at for kind of future areas of research? Um, well, the, the whole issue of the relationship between, you know, more tolerance towards women taking on non-traditional roles and how that is correlated with economic freedom is a current project of mine. And so I am starting to find that countries that are more economically free, um, they don't have a, they don't tend to prioritize men um, when it comes to employment opportunities, education opportunities, and political leadership opportunities. More economic freedom means there's a less bias less of a bias towards men when it comes to those opportunities. All right. I've enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for this today. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. This was uh, Rosemary Fike. She is an instructor of economics at Texas Christian University and a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe on YouTube and wherever you stream your podcasts. And to stream old episodes, learn more about the show, and where to subscribe and submit your questions for future guests, visit FraserForum.org.